Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel where we talk about real crimes and real people. Don't forget to subscribe, click the notification bell button and give this video a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. And for today, I bring you the murder of Shafali Ahmed, a 17-year-old girl who was killed in what they call honor killing. And one thing is for sure, there is no honor in murder. Killing someone because you can't control them and use religion, culture as an excuse, it's not honorable, it's evil. Like many victims of the so-called honor killings, justice seemed unreachable for Shafali. Did she get justice? I have talked about a case of honor killing in my channel before, Kendil Balosh, who was murdered by her brother in Pakistan and her killer walked free. Kandil didn't get justice. Did the same thing happen to Shafali? Let's find out. Let's get started. A decision has been made and you must obey it. I control how you should look, how you should behave, and who should you surround yourself with. I am going to call it religious beliefs, but we all know I just simply want to control everything about you. I own you and I'm going to give you a way to whomever I please. If you deny it, I will use force upon you until I break you to do what I want. So I can control you. And if you still refuse to abide my command, I will kill you. And I will call it honor, even though I'm far from honorable. But I know I have the support of many and I will get away with it because it's okay to kill you when I say you brought shame into our abode, even though I am shameless. Your cruel demise, I will call it an honorable killing. Shafili Ahmed was born on July 14, 1986 in Bradford, West Yorkshire, UK. Shafali's parents were Iftikhar and Fatsana. They were ultra-conservative, born in the rural village of Utam in Gujarat district in Pakistan. Shafali's father was still married to a Danish woman when Shafali was born and he also had a son already. Iftikhar, who demanded honor from Shafali, who condemned her and saw her as someone who brought shame to the family, was actually the one who was shameless. But he wasn't alone. Iftikhar was pressured to marry his cousin Farzana. She was pregnant with Shafali while Iftikhar was still married. Basically, two morally corrupt individuals who demanded things they didn't have themselves. Iftikhar was described as someone with a quick temper, he broke a colleague's window, punched him, and he was prosecuted and fined for criminal damages. In another occasion, he grabbed the customers by his necktie because he didn't have a change for a 10-pound bill. What is interesting is Iftikhar Ahmed allegedly once mentioned to a colleague about Lake District, where you wouldn't be able to find a body. Interesting conversation, isn't it? After Shafali was born, they moved to Warrington, Chester. Shafile Ahmed had a very conservative upbringing. She wanted to go to college to become a lawyer. She was described as shy, quiet, bright. She was friendly. She was caring, high-spirited and brave. Shafile wanted to be free. She struggled to balance her dreams with her family's upbringing. She didn't have much of a life outside college. Shafali attended Great Sankey High School and then she attended Prickly College. She was an A-level student. Her biggest fear was of an arranged marriage which her parents had already arranged. Shafali used to disappear a lot. She wanted to escape her fate and her arranged marriage. She used to run away from home since she was 11. Over the years, she kept telling authorities about the abuse and being forced to marry in Pakistan. Her parents wanted Shafali to marry a cousin 10 years older than her and be a devoted wife in Pakistan. Even though she went to school, she had to do house chores at night at the house before being allowed to do schoolwork. Her parents used to beat her up because she refused to marry her cousin. 
they wanted to control her so one of them would hold her down while the other would beat her their goal was to break her until she accepted the proposal but she didn't budge they saw Shafali as damaged goods because Shafali had friends who were boys she had brought shame on the family they hated Shafali's embrace of the Western culture even though they lived in a Western country. They were ashamed she would become Westernized. She didn't like the way she dressed and didn't like the way she looked. They hated the fact that she looked Westernized. Shafali went through several incidents of violence at the hands of her parents. Shafali dyed her hair once and she put on false nails. Her mother washed her hair, ripped the nails and called her a slut. In one occasion, when Shafali ran away from home, she stayed with a friend. She had nowhere to live. She was homeless. Once Shafali was absent from school, a school teacher called and asked her if she should be worried. And Shafali said yes. She returned to school. She had faded bruising on her neck and a cut lip. Her mother had held her down while her father beat her up. She was then referred to social services. A social worker visited the school, but Shafali downplayed the incident. She didn't have any injuries. She said she was going to marry in Pakistan. She really didn't want to have social services involved at the end of it at all. She loved her family. Things didn't go so smooth either for the rest of her family. For some reason, in May 2002, Farzana and her five children were thrown out, out of the house by Iftikar. But then they returned, and the abuse against Shafali continued. Later that year, in November 2002, a friend of Shafali found her near the college looking cold and shaken. She had been absent for a week and a half. She presented faded bruises. She had scratches on the left side of her neck. She had been locked on the house and not allowed out. It's clear by now, Shafali had had a life of suffering. She had been treated cruelly by her parents because she didn't want to do what they wanted her to do. Shafali had a friend who was a boy she had met in 2002 in a vacation trip. He slipped a note with his number. They used to talk. Shafali would talk about her concerns and fears, the violence she was subjected at the hands of her parents, the forced marriage. And in January 2003, he tried to help Shafali. He tried to help her escape the arranged marriage. Shafali ran away from home. The two of them spent two nights at his brother's house. Then they went to bed and breakfast. The two weren't intimate according to him. Shafali was gone and her parents kept calling but she didn't answer the phone. By February 3rd, 2003, Shafali had been missing. Her father went to school and threatened to take her out. And then he found Shafali. He shoved her into his taxi. She was crying. She ran to the school and told the teacher who called the police. She spoke to the police and then returned home. Later, Shafali went on a trip from hell. She went with her family to Pakistan and things became so unbearable, Shafali drank bleach to escape her parents. This caused tremendous damage to her throat. By May 2003, she had lost a lot of weight because of her throat injuries. She couldn't eat, drink or swallow saliva. When she returned to UK, Shafali went to the hospital. Her parents told she had mistaken the bleach for mouthwash. The medical staff asked Shafali why she drank the bleach and she said her parents had accepted the marriage proposal and had also taken her passport. Iftikhar told a nurse not to give information about Shafali to anyone else other than her parents. The Ahmeds were described as loveless and the children seemed all frightened. It became clear the Ahmed children lived in a terror of their evil parents. Early September 2003, the day before Shafali was killed, she texted her male friend and asked him to meet her. He never responded. He was getting married. Then, on September 11, 2003, Shafali Ahmed went missing again, and this time her parents didn't report it. 
or didn't try to call her repeatedly like they did before. A teacher in Great Sankey High School overheard Shafley's siblings talking about her disappearance and her parents, so the teacher called the police. Initially, Shafley's disappearance was considered and communicated as a missing person's inquiry. A search began when Shafley didn't show up for treatment to her throat, and the police suspected she had been killed in an honor killing because she had rejected the marriage proposal. Her parents denied forcing her to marry. Her parents' behavior became more and more suspicious. The police asked her father why he didn't report it and if the car said she was at least 16 and the police said there was nothing they could do. If the car told the police she had taken her western clothes and he seemed disgusted by it. He was obstructive, angry and showed no concern by Shafley's disappearance. Both parents stated everything was normal. A Glasgow pharmacy contacted the police because they thought they had CCTV footage that showed Shafley in it. They showed the footage to the parents and they say, yes, it was her, it was indeed Shafley. Interesting enough, her teacher said it wasn't. And the suspicion on her parents increased. Two months later, the police installed a listening device in the Ahmed family home. In the recordings, they could hear if the car stating the system in the UK work on proof. Without it, they can do nothing to you. It was also discussed what would happen if the police found DNA evidence in the car. In February 2004, a workman found dismembered skeletal and decomposed human remains by the River Kent in Sedwick, Cumbria. The body had been hidden. Autopsy results showed part of the skull was missing. There was no signs of blood on the clothes to indicate head injuries. The death was ruled unnatural. The individual had been killed elsewhere. Cause of death was most likely strangulation or suffocation. The body was identified by dental records and clothing. The body was identified as Shafali Ahmed. If the car and Farzana identified the gold zigzag bracelet and blue topaz ring in the body as Shafilis. Shafali wasn't missing, she was dead. And the shadiest thing of all was her parents who fought against the decision on the coroner's quest which basically stated Shafali had been murdered. Most parents want to know why their child died, but not the Ahmeds. In January 2008, an inquest in Kindel Cumbria into Shafley's death ruled it as an unlawful killing. The coroner stated Shafley had been subjected to a very vile murder. Shafley's parents and other members of the family were arrested and then released. Eight members of the family were arrested on suspicions of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice but the charges were dropped. Authorities found an unidentified human hair on Shafley's foot and the case went cold for a long time. Then, on August 25, 2010, Alicia Ahmed Shafali's sister was arrested for robbery. She had arranged an unarmed robbery at her parents' home. Then Alicia told something to the police that would help solve a murder. Alicia told the police she saw her parents hold Shafali down and murder her. They killed Shafali because she resisted. Her mother had had enough and told Iftikhar to finish it off. They stuffed a plastic bag in her mouth and she suffocated to death. Everything started with an argument. Fartzana picked up Shafali at her part-time job and the argument turned violent. And that violence turned into death. The motive of the argument? Shafali's attire. Shafali was completely westernized as they call it. She was wearing a t-shirt, a hooded cardigan and a tight fitting trousers. On September 7, 2011, eight years after Shafli's Ahmed murder, her parents Iftikhar and Farzana Ahmed were arrested and charged with Shafli's murder. The Ahmeds had hid the abuse from school, social services and the police, and they claimed everything authorities had on them was nothing but racial prejudice. The trial started in May 2012, Alicia Shafli's sister testified. She 
she stated, Shafali's eyes were wide in shock. She was kicking her legs as she struggled to breathe. Alicia was horrified and saw Shafali's legs stop kicking. She ran into her bedroom. She saw from her window her father carry Shafali's body wrapped in bin bags into his car. She also witnessed her mother sorting out flowery pattern sheets, bin bags, and rolls of tape. All the children were present when they killed Shafley, and they told them not to tell anyone. Alicia had actually told a friend about the killing, but then recanted. She denied her parents had killed Shafley. There was a twist during trial. Fartana Ahmed changed her statement. Her new version of events was basically she turned against Iftikhar. She stated she tried to intervene and her husband punched her. She thought Shafali was safe and he threatened her and her children. When Iftikhar found out about Farzana's reverse UNO card, he said he loved his wife and that she was lying. He hadn't armed his daughter. Iftikhar and Farzana Ahmed were found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum sentence of 25 years. Even though only Iftikhar and Farzana were charged and found guilty, the police believe they had help disposing the body. And I agree. Everything Shafali wanted was to be free. But she lived in a cruel prison at her own home, tortured by her parents. Shafali at the end had justice. But let's keep in mind, these murders they call honor killings are a reality. She only had justice because she was killed in the UK. If the crime had happened in Pakistan, her killers would walk free and would be celebrated. If Shafali being westernized was so shameful, if a western country is so shameful, why were they living in a western country? It had nothing to do with the West. It was all about control. They couldn't fathom, they couldn't control Shafali. Hopefully, they will never walk free. Sadly, another victim, Kandil Balosh, she didn't get justice for her murder. At the end, her entire family are shameless leeches who smooched on her money. But when it came to honor her and demand her killer to be locked up forever, they were cowards. May those who commit honor killings never have peace in their lives.